one of the first group of German students to come to the U.S., so I do have an accent. Furthermore, in, as you will hear, uh, I was in the military both in Korea and during the Vietnam conflict. Uh, I have some injuries, and now I'm old. And as far as the VA is concerned, I'm category eight because I make too much money, or I did, even though KU is not uh, very generous with anthropology professors necessarily. But in any event, so if you have trouble understanding me, uh, please ask me to repeat it, and you will get used to a slight or strong German accent, <laughs> because it's good in HDS if you get used to foreign accents. Um, as I say, I'm quite old. I was a teenager during World War II in Germany, and uh, I experienced that as the first war in which I was involved. Uh, I lived, uh, I went to school about 30 kilometers from Berlin in Potsdam. And uh, at the end of the war, of course, you We were asked, uh, how much English do you know? And I did tell them, I know how to say, I surrender. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here really to try to uh, encourage you to think about uh, field work. Because I feel that if anthropology has any merit at all, it must have a component of fieldwork. You can't be an anthropologist and sit in an office or just in front of a computer. You must go to the field. And what I want to do over the two days, uh, today I thought I'd give you an introduction of what I feel you should know about fieldwork. I'm simply trying to encourage you to think about it. Uh, I've been teaching in American universities uh, for 49 years before I retired in 2010. Uh, I'm still, I still have students who haven't finished, and obviously. In a way, I'm very grateful to you and HDS to have me back. In 2007, uh, I was the anthropologist that trained the first cycle of HDS uh, with Montgomery McFaith and Steve Fontecaro sitting in the back, freezing in the garages, you know, uh, discussing. problems. Comparing cultures really has the same thing, because I find having well, being an immigrant and having served in the American military, I remember that uh, I, 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 as you will see eventually, and I tell you, I flew 100 missions in Korea in the 1860s, and I had a crew chief who told me, 
uh, with all due respect, uh, Lieutenant, uh, you know, if you want to survive in the American military, you must know the F word. And I said yes, and he said, uh, you don't want to get killed because people will ask you, you know, they don't know your name, you I couldn't pronounce correctly the whispering whippoorwillow went on vacation and how many vehicles are in the valley. And so I never had to identify myself. Uh, I was just the crowd up there, you know, doing a job. Um, I've never forgotten that lesson because in German there is no word, really, the German word that starts with V, uh, you know, by, by that word. So, obviously, language is, is extremely important, and I stand before you uh, many of my students, when I ask them how many languages do you speak, they tell me, well, Professor Moss, you should learn English first. And uh, I think I'm adequate, but anyway. So ethnographic fieldwork and comparing cultures is fundamental to what we do. I find from the earliest HDS experiences I had, was that um, in HDS really know not enough about the military. The military is a culture, and you have to know that an O1 is different from an O6 and that an E1 is different from an O1. So the kind of structure that the military has something to think about, you must think about it seriously. And if he's an O5 and O6, uh, then obviously it's very serious for you to think about it. So I find that unfortunately the notion that a military culture is different from American culture, and surely many of you have been in academics, and certainly I am an academic first. Uh, academia is a very different culture. A department of anthropology is very different from a department of psychology or, uh, or political science. So I urge you to think about that you are constantly comparing different cultures. And to make sense of different cultures obviously demands that you know several cultures reasonably well. Uh, Oh, can I ask you the next one? Yeah. So I better ask you. So when we when we look at uh, ethnography, you know that graphy in Greek means description. So ethnography basically literally means a description of a people. Ethnology, on the other hand, ethnos. Ology means comparing. Uh, I did send uh, Marcus uh, a, a paper that I read to the Applied Anthropology uh, meeting in 1977 in San Diego. I had just come back from Thailand where I experienced my first roadblock 
and the paper deals with some of my ideas and thoughts. How do you do anthropology when somebody shoots at you? What kind of thinking do I bring to a situation and how do I have to change? I mean, I'm no longer a welcome anthropologist, but now I'm maybe a person that has to be killed. And obviously that changed my thinking about doing field work, and it really hasn't changed since then. So ethnography, to my thinking, remains fundamental to anything that you do in a non-American or non-Western culture. You have to both learn to describe the culture, and then you have to analyze it, and you have to compare it. And obviously, in order to compare it, you need to have a strong foundation in your own culture. Uh, at the end of my life, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm married to a, a PhD anthropologist from Taiwan, a Chinese. So <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm completely acculturated as an American, uh, when I go back to Europe, I find, and I have been occasionally to the German military HDS in Koblenz. I don't know if you and beer and all the things that Germans like. So you're looking at a person who, by force, having made a living in the United States and having fought in a couple of wars with Americans, I had to acculturate myself to different cultures. So comparing and describing is fundamental to what you have to do in HTS. The next one. The word culture, it used to belong to anthropologists. I remember Margaret Mead in the 1960s, 62, uh, when she was pulled off a stage in, in Philadelphia because uh, she was quite sympathetic to some of us who had been in, in Vietnam and had been in, in Laos, in my case. And uh, obviously, some anthropologists felt very strongly about that this was a no-no. And they pulled it off stage. And I remember that at the time she began to talk about anthropology in the 19. 30s. Uh, many of you may know, and who you don't know, the first anthropology degree in the United States was given in the 1890s. That's not long ago. In other words, they are, I'm probably the, the second generation. Many of my teachers at the University of Washington in Seattle uh, were students that uh, of Margaret Mead and, and some even knew Papa Boas. Uh, today, that's far removed from the structures of anthropology today. But the word culture now is used everywhere. You have business culture. You have HDS culture. You have uh, University of Kansas basketball team culture. You, you have different, but I, I have a, a book with me, and I'd be glad to show it to you. There are more than 800 different definitions.
I find I started out anthropometry, and as a graduate student, I made a living in uh, working for the quartermaster corps, measuring subcutaneous fat on students. You know, you uh, anthropometry deals with uh, sizing uniforms and seats of airplanes and tanks, etc. And so I started out as a biological anthropologist. I, I became very that I see human <coughs> beings really as the result of two major influences. One, obviously, is our biology. In Kansas, you may not be aware that we are now arguing about a bill in, in, uh, in Kansas politics that deals with personhood. Personhood means that the being starts at conception. So at conception, that person who is really 46, Notion, but it's up to you. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. But biology and the 46 chromosomes means that up to now we could change little or none at all. In other words, I can't join the KU basketball team because <laughs> I'm a lousy basketball player. But I was on the ski team of the University of Washington. I'm a very good downhill skier because I'm not very tall. Biological part of what we are, you can't really change up to now. Now we have genetic engineering. You have plastic surgery, etc. <laughs> you can change, but in my generation, really, there were there was very little chance that the bio biological part. Whatever. Culture, on the other hand is always learned. You are not born an American, but you become an American by socialization. You learn. Fish and an egg as if you have lived in Japan or so, you always get some terribly cold things in the morning, and obviously that's not us. But the way we dress, as I say, uh, you. Uh, if you appear suddenly in a ball gown, to one of your HDS meetings, people will probably wash you out in no time. But the way you get to do it is very culturally determined. I don't want to go in any further. I don't think HDS would ever ask me that if I do. Uh, but uh, believe me, believe me. Culture is choice. So my definition, and there's no reason you should accept that definition out of the 800 plus definitions, my definition of culture is mankind's social inheritance. In other words, 
we inherit certain be cultural behavior because we were socialized by parents, we learned it in school, we learned to fit in into a certain subculture, and therefore I urge you to come to the point where you have Mine is simply one that uh, I have learned to treasure because I really think that culture is the social part of inheriting, not the biological part. Next one. Culture, in my feeling then, in my thinking, determines our behavior. And as I was coming in here, I asked uh, several of the kind people that received me, why is it that America, since World War II, has done so badly? We didn't win in Korea. Uh, Kim Jong-un, who is the obviously obviously is trying to uh, terminate the armistice that has existed since 1953. And uh, the choices that are being made in Korea and China and elsewhere in the world, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, are cultural choices Happy with me, and I'm happy if you do, is that we have neglected to learn other cultures. Uh, even though it is probably true that uh, I have a, a Chinese mate. I, Uh, I have learned a lot about the Chinese, and tomorrow, uh, if you if you want to, uh, I intend to uh, focus on maybe culture like China. And today I talk about maybe at the end about Nepal. For the last ten years, I've been working with. Tibet in Islamic cultures. I guess my German romanticism is just too weird for them. I don't quite fit into this very <coughs> tight structure. I've done well in Buddhist cultures. Uh, I love my work with Tibetans and as you will hear and Obviously, I'm not here to convince you of anything, and certainly not politics. I love Tibetans because I, I love the place, I, I, I love the mountains, and I, I'm not... well in Africa, some of you will do well in uh, China or Afghanistan or Iraq, and some of you won't. The sooner you admit to yourself, gee, this is not for me, you know, I don't really like these people. 
I'm too critical. I, I, you know, I'm just like a nail that sticks out that has to be hammered. If you do well in describing the culture and analyzing the culture, you probably have empathy. And eventually when we talk, when we talk about ethics in anthropology, you're looking at a person who stands directly in the middle between the military and my discipline anthropology. There are many things be, having been in the military, and on the other hand, I'm certainly I'm, I show that there's a book by David Price in which I am a whole chapter, you know, that I'm the most evil person in anthropology you can think of, because I believe that HDS, the idea, is a very necessary idea that has to be carried on. And I had no qualms at all uh, choosing to be loyal to this country, not necessarily that it's God's own country and the best and all that, but clearly it is one of the least worst. And since I'm living here as a citizen of the country, I feel an obligation to do something about my beliefs. Um, let's stop for a moment and talk about some of the controversy about culture. Uh, in many of the national meetings, and uh, this year I, I became a distinguished member of the Anthropological Association, a distinguished member. A couple of years ago, they wanted to uh, deprive me of my membership. <laughs> but, uh, but in any event, uh, the reason that ethics today are so problematic is that I keep talking about, and people say, well, don't give us that old baloney keep talking about if you were a German anthropologist in World War II and you were as a neutral anthropological observer were observing the Einsatzgruppen in Lithuania or Ukraine or wherever and shooting 6,000 people a day, or gassing them, or loading them in trucks, and whatever. So I don't accept the idea that in all cases you must do no harm as an anthropologist. You, you must have a very clear idea where you, as an individual anthropologist, stand. You must have a sense of ethics that apply to you, that you can defend in public, to the military, or to a, however. So a very simplistic idea that do no harm, to have informed consent. As I pointed out to you, the first time I ran into a roadblock, in Thailand, and people were shooting at me. Why are you? I'm an anthropologist. I'm you on your side. You know, I'm not. I'm not here to to blame you or to take away anything from you. I'm here as a neutral observer. It doesn't work. As a native-born German, I never had any problem seeing people or understanding people who hate me. I never had any problems. Obviously, 
what happened in World War II in my generation, and I was, a, as I say, a teenager, uh, we had to clean up uh, a concentration camp as teenagers. Uh, the Russians uh, beat us, and they said, you are kids, we are not beating you. We are beating you for the sins of your fathers and mothers. <laughs> but anyway, I saw what happened, what Germans did, not only to other Germans, but obviously to other populations. And there's no excuse in, in my view. I had to deal with that, that uh, Certainly at the University of Kansas, there were some individuals who were Poles who were uh, in concentration camps and they didn't want to talk to me, they didn't want to have coffee with me, they didn't drive a Volkswagen, they never went to... I could understand that. For Americans, I think it is very difficult because naturally we think we should be loved. We do so much good. You know, we, we come with chocolates, and we come with money, and we come with programs, like HDS, supposedly understanding. Uh, so, we never have any problems. I think that's very important. You must have your own definition of culture, and you must have a very strong definition of yourself. What are you as a professional? What are your ethics? What do you do when you are in another country, in another culture, where they not necessarily may like you? You still have no choice. I mean, uh, I, I don't know HDS at the moment. You can opt out and buy your own ticket and fly back home, I guess. But you must have this strong ability to analyze yourself. Why am I here? What do I believe in? So culture determines choices in your behavior, in the way you're thinking, and certainly the way you're acting. In many ways, uh, some people I'm still too Germanic because I'm too aggressive. You know, I, I like people who are straightforward. Uh, so when people uh, die, I don't call them they have departed or they have gone to a better or that. They died. Period. They get killed. Why have all these terms that mean absolutely nothing? Because uh, we will talk about interrogation and interpret interpreters. There's no, there's no easy way to look at torture. It's torture. Don't call it enhanced interrogation. You know, what you're doing is... Really, uh, I wonder, you know, interrogation, and we will talk about it, demands patience, demands linguistic. But anyway, so action is embedded in your own culture. You can't get away from it. I, I can't help myself of being what I am, and to some people it's too aggressive and too straightforward. Don't, don't use all these fancy terms to shade, you know. When somebody's dead, he died or she died. That's simple. Okay, next one. You can learn another culture without taking a deeper look at your own. I think too few Americans look at themselves 
and begin to ask, what is happening to our culture? When you are riding in a bus with high school students, and now grade school students, they don't sends you a text message rather than coming next door and say, listen, I have a problem. Not anymore. So, you have to take a look at your own culture. Uh, we talked earlier about that if you are deployed to Afghanistan, and I understand most of the teams are in Afghanistan, right? Yes. You have to realize that you're dealing with a tradition and behavior is passed on orally. When you train or you instruct Afghanis that are not literate like you are, you have to be aware. How do you teach somebody to use an M16 if they can't write down, you know, your instructions? You have to repeat it. So I think your action. that you should or cannot take for granted. Next. You cannot learn another culture without taking a deeper look. For the government or the intelligence or whatever is um, you, you have to come to terms with your own ethics. Oh, I, I shouldn't step out of... <laughs> okay. uh, family. Family, okay. Anything else? Associations. Associations, uh, organizations you belong to. Uh, that's why we have a Supreme Court. We are constantly arguing, is it constitutional? This is our main argument. Today, I mean, we are deciding many things. Motion. There's no word, but yet it's the interpretation of, on the one hand, of individual. But America is held together by the Constitution. Secondly, America is held together by religion. When my brothers visit me in Lawrence, Kansas, and I drive around Lawrence, Kansas, and I show them the one held together, really, in this endless conversation of, and for a while until Friday midnight, God spoke German, and now we don't have a German Pope, we have maybe an Italian speaking Pope, but, but anyway, it means that to me at least, one thing that is the glue that keeps America together is constitution, religion, and 
something that is changing as we are speaking right now. What is it? Language. English. Why has English become a world language? Uh, we have the largest economy. You can butcher it beyond recognition and still be understood. You don't have to worry about the words. In German, I mean, der Tisch, das Mädchen, die Tür, all the endless, your sexing objects, you know, whoever would think of that. That's correct. The people help you, and obviously, pitching if you have worked in New Guinea. Uh, so, but as we are speaking, I, being an immigrant, have given lots of money to English first <laughs> because I've often acted as an interpreter, and I will tell you more about it. In Los Angeles County, uh, in 2010, when I was there, they had 156 languages that the district court in Los Angeles had to... You, when you are in a court, as you may know, you are provided with a court official interpreter if you can't understand English. It costs Los Angeles... take a driver's test in Chinese. You can take a driver's test in Korean. I happen to think if you want to save money, every official document is in English. Every official procedure is in one language, English, if that is our language. It costs money to have two or three. That doesn't mean that I don't speak other languages. Of course I do. That doesn't mean I don't encourage you to speak other languages. Of course you should. But one official language saves money. And today this is a hotly debated topic. If you go to certain parts of the United States, if you don't know Spanish, you're up to credit. Um, there are parts of the United States, including Kansas, if you go west to some of the meatpacking plants and all that, it's not English. And I think for the sake of our own country and keeping it cemented, we must make up our mind to have one official language. I hope you will debate with me because many people don't think so. Sir, did you want to go ahead and take a break now? What's that? Did you want to go ahead and take a break now? Okay. And we speed up quickly to the slides and keep my ethnographic. Can I turn around? You're fine. Ethnographic. One slice. You know, 1958 or January 24, diachronic, you take several slices. You take 1959, 60, 61. So you need really to be aware that fieldwork is most productive if it's repetitive. This uh, is observation.
Chairman, you must have several interviews are fundamental and they must be conducted in the local language. That is the weakest point of the American military. I, at the Army War College, <laughs> had a long debate when I argued that if after the fall of Baghdad, if we had 10,000 Arabic speaking American soldiers, the looting would not have So by not having really enough people who speak the language, if more American soldiers knew Tajik or Uzbek or Pashto, we would do much better than we are doing. And learning a language is a pain in the convenience, you know. I, th I think learning a language is a talent. Some people find it more easy, some people find it more difficult. interpreters should be evaluated critically. I will tell you, having worked uh, just briefly, <laughs> keep my story short, I worked in Panyunjan as an interpreter. You may not recall the Swedes and Swiss were for the UN side, the Poles and Czechs were for the communist side. Uh, they when we were in meetings with North Koreans, uh, did you tell the son of a bitches to drop? Therefore, I translated as our side respectfully submits to your side That's the real weak part of American military. We take people who had gone to school and had studied English and all that, we make them interpreters, and the shame was we left behind many people who opted for us were our interpreters and we didn't make friends and American military <laughs> loves numbers you know <laughs> but you are doing qualitative research as well as quantitative so you must be aware of what this is from every more time? Got it? Okay, next one. Decoding a foreign culture can be best accomplished by being an active participant. I saw one of the first Buddhist monks burning himself. He went across the street to a gas station, had a bucket, 
And then he poured it over himself and he lit himself. We just stood there transfixed. How can I remain neutral? And in the last 11 months, more than 100 Tibetans have burnt themselves to death. More than 100 in 11 months. Next one. Cultural, uh, cultural ideas, practice must be viewed in their proper context and should not be judged in terms of your own culture. They have to be in their proper context. Next one. And tell me if I go too fast, but having prepared the slides, I feel I should run through them and give you an idea, okay? How does one judge the accuracy of ethnographic data? Is most better than Smith? <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> but, you know, how do you tell? You have to make a judgment. How do you deal with contradictions? We are wonderful, but yet, we are killing people. Can you be an objective observer in a war or in an insurgency? Facts in ethnography are far more complex than facts in the physical sciences. It's more difficult. It's not just an experiment, experiment in a test tube. It's a living situation. At the graph, you determine what is context and subject. Next one. I, I guess you will have available these slides, right? That's correct. Yeah. The way choices are fitted together creates the character of a culture. Organization and context. You must organize. The hardest thing I found was that after a day in the field, you have to sit down and write your field notes. You have to develop your own. You have to devise your own system. You know, maybe text examination of traits, various operate in Morocco best is and it was very comfortable never went to Japan all of her at a distance, but still, to me, it's one of the most brilliant analysis.
things in life. Patterns, what anthropologists rationale and logic of the institutions that people live by. Search for patterns in the culture requires that methods. What are the methods? like uh, it directions that help we can't get away from it I Militarization of anthropology. You have to. Keeps us together. Certain. except eight months or so because I'm category anyway okay demography because Every year, there will be roughly a hundred and twenty million Japanese. Demography means and Japanese women simply not only do they marry late, but they don't have children. Or they have one child. If you watch 60 Minutes last Sunday, they have cities and blocks of empty buildings because in China many people bought two or three apartments when the Communist Party loosened but that will take one generation minimally two generations so I think one of the next Real crisis in the People's Republic will be real estate, just like California. Fragmented identities. We are members of different, you know, professional, personal church. Permanent. It's conflict that is driving
running over to the sale of the company. In America, some of the CTOs now get three Look at Greece. I'm not an economist, but certainly as an anthropologist, I see this bifurcation really everywhere at work. Next. Uh, here, I would. The, the yeah. Uh, you know about first, second, third, fourth generation of warfare. Lynn's idea that at the Army War College that, you know, the fourth generation, obviously, insurgency, it's no longer... You, you, have you heard about four generations of warfare, all of you? technology. Yeah, people always ask me, a lot of the stuff that we do in the lab says that virtual experiences can profoundly affect you in wonderful and not so wonderful ways. These experiences are happening and the world And at the leading edge is the U.S. military. You to be as comfortable. Yeah. In Iraq, and is now being treated with virtual reality therapy at the Manhattan VA, one of over 40 centers around the country piloting the program. But early results are encouraging. Under certain circumstances, their whole posture will change. We basically continue through anxiety rate uh, so far. Over time, their brain is able to say, okay, this is uncomfortable, this is unpleasant, but it's not a life threatening situation. I can tone down the level of anxiety and stress. Right, you ready? Look at all the things that surround us. Everything from the internet to jet engines, these are all things where the military has been a driver for technology. But it also creates new dilemmas, new questions you need to answer. From the air-conditioned rooms on this Air Force base in the desert outside Las Vegas, pilots fly unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, that execute missions in a The plane's cameras can surveil their targets from up to nine miles overhead. Yeah, I know something may be employing weapons at this time. 
one time, we had Intel that you know, there was a bad guy riding around on a motorcycle, if you will. And uh, he was just riding around and he stopped at two or three different playgrounds and he's playing soccer with all of these kids, you know, and he's just, he's living his life, and he's just doing his normal everyday life. And then, you know, sure enough, at the end of that ride, though, we found him at a uh, meeting of bad people. And it ended up resulting in a strike, so you end up seeing what happens. Laser five rifle, time of They do take a lot of care about civilian casualties. It is very much on our mind, but um, there's no way for them to really tell. All they see is the bomb going into that building and it blowing up. They don't necessarily see what happens afterwards. A drone can't dig through the rubble and killed in airstrikes in Afghanistan. to one of the pilots about it. So you, you don't think you've ever hit someone you don't intend to hit? No, no, I, I... The guy gives me strength, and he gives me wisdom. You might never see your family again. And then at the end of the day, And we're finding that some of these drone pilots actually have combat stress and to unwind, airmen stationed at the base come here. To hang out and play. Uh, they're definitely a technology generation. Or to have any previous flying experience. If your job is to sit on your butt all day and to be a good hacker and have a big butt, Delphia area, and replace them with this. Kids 13 and up can play on one of dozens of Xboxes and PC gaming stations. Uh, 
Temple of Autonomous. Part on the Apple Store. Encourage you to go learn more, just as Apple's trying to do. It can't embrace today's digital youth. They are never going to recruit. Next to the gaming station. in a recruiting environment, the Army is using the adrenaline rush to encourage kids to I think I made the point that you're going to have virtual HDS. You sit in an office in Fort Leavenworth. and others at the Army War College, when they came up with first, second, third, fourth, I see this with atomic uh, It's one thing to sit about 30 miles at preach in Nevada, I mean, if you talk to the people. I I got in trouble with the VA because I, I don't think I had post-traumatic stress, but is it from my German experience? It's, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's incredible, but you belong in a world where the virtual reality generation. I, when I fly. People don't understand. Go to the airport 10 minutes before the flight. I mean, you just walk in and you check your bags free <laughs> and then you fly. And the food was great. You don't remember the old days. It all changed with 9 years. Virtual warfare is changing the way we look at war. As an old timer who flew World War II airplanes, which are a little bit like multi This is no longer the case. We are now a virtual reality and I see the danger that Americans are beginning to believe that we can fight clean wars. We can only we are lulling ourselves that 
by waging virtual wars, we now have 7,500 drones. Kansas is going to have a drone, you know, over Kansas looking how much moisture we need and all that. Really helps me to have the Air Force now trains more. To, you know, on the deck and count it. Did, but nevertheless, I was there. They, they fight wars on business hours from because I never changed my attitude. We must have a draft. If a country I tell you the story later if I have time about my article. I taught at the Naval War College and at the article arguing for the draft. Okay, next How can you tell a Taliban from a non-Taliban? How can you tell? This how you are going to on the internet and you use at the end of his across cultural boundaries
uh, go rapidly if you tune down. Uh, just keep on going. And I end. The Chinese, and do, do we leave time for questions or what is the procedure? We can go ahead and have a question session now. We, we quit you? at 12, right? Yes. And what happens in the afternoon? The afternoon we have other classes they have to attend. So I have the same audience or no? Tomorrow you'll have the same audience. I see. Uh, because I thought I give you the general ideas today and the more specific work tomorrow. Uh, just rapidly. But uh, oh, yeah, go back. Uh, okay, go back. I mean, you you have to have empathy. You know, as I say, uh, for the last 10 years, uh, this is uh, Tibetan uh, uh, monastery. OK, next one. Uh, recently, uh, just a couple of months ago, I took off. Uh, I flew Swiss from Delhi to Zurich. And the flight was delayed for one hour because there was a cow on the runway. In India, to kill a cow is a, is a crime. And um, the flight was delayed. They had to go out with the jeep and find the cow. And obviously, even Swiss. Uh, Delhi now is the world's second largest airport. But it closed down because of a cow. So I learned very quickly, I better learn to deal with cows if you do field work in that part of the world. OK, come on. A young man. <laughs> come on. A young man. Come on. Uh, wait. Obviously, as at that time, as a fact forwarder, uh, observer, in that sense has not changed and if you don't recognize this is your face things they do okay go on was the Joint Chief of Staff, if it was in the 1960s when he was And I remember I walked into his office and Bill Crow up with a regular diesel sub I worked for 10 years <coughs> in Micronesia for Bill Crow, and then this is in Palau. We are not. We were paid. Yeah. 
learned about drugs because when you had a headache and every month I said ah hi you can, you can. They put me into a crop replacement. You look at a very stupid. Stupid and honest, you know, but that's I need most by Z. Your eyes really get swollen. successful in HDS. And you can't become a why I was in 2007, <laughs> essence of one part of HDS that demands free. I know about okay. Uh, ten minutes shall be open for questions. Uh, uh, my father was in the German military as an advisor to the nationalist Chinese. So as a child I was in Manchuria. That was my first humor. <laughs> As a kid, when the Axis was created, and obviously German officers helping Chiang Kai shek fighting the Japanese was not what Adolf wanted. And then came World War II, I came to America. I thought this is the end of my wars and all that. And Lord and behold, two years after, and before you as a total failure. Failure in the sense that I have not been able really to convince if you fight an insurgency, your problem is.
the benefit. the people you are working with. I leave you with that. And <coughs> I leave you by I have no intent that you should believe me. I have no intent of changing your mind about anything at least think about what I have been telling you for the last two hours. That's it, folks. So we have 10 minutes. I'm open to, I hope you will argue with me. Come on. Tell me to drop that, uh, you know. To... You got a question. You talk, sir, uh, you mentioned the Japanese committing suicide by Yes. Not having immigration. But to their culture, in southern Europe, they aren't reproducing. So without immigration, you know, aging population, all that. But at the same time, on the other hand, you talk about places that are becoming overpopulated. They're Absolutely. Like that. So, couldn't the Japanese, isn't there a way for them to mitigate and adapt and still maintain what they? It's the 90s, Ezra Vogel of Harvard wrote a book called Japan is Number One. You know, the Japanese were buying Rockefeller centers. It's the Chinese. Uh, I'm afraid that Japanese are very soft. They are receptacles. are working in the Islamic culture. Uh, you know, the Quran is beautiful Arabic. I, I am a neophyte, and I, obviously. But I some cultures are soft. I would say Japan is a very hard culture. That tradition and the ethos of the culture wander in a Japanese park. I mean, there are many Japanese now overseas, but immigrants. which obviously very few Westerners do. Uh, so by not accepting, you know, labor film, their Medicare program, which is quite good, they are Out Japanese work. it has to change in the fundamental
that keeps America together. <laughs> Constitution, language, etc. Japanese doesn't have the <laughs> and anyway, that, that could be any other. Come on, I'm here. Yeah. Anthropology for be an anthropologist without human genetics. We are social science because if you learn cultural anthropology, you are part of a humanity division. If you look at the literature and you look at myth and you look, so we are the only disciplines that. natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. We are the only discipline that has representative in universities in all three. So to me, anthropology is useful to intelligence, to the military, because we can't keep fighting wars in places we don't know anything about. The American Anthropological Association has taken a depth view of the program. What, are, what, are in, what problem exists that some great dude is going to say, buy me an anthropologist? Well, it's, it's, it's exemplified in me. A few years ago, they were going to throw me out and tell me, you know, and last year they made me a distinguished member. It's, it's the ambivalence and the contradiction, you know. Is he, is he really an anthropologist, or is he just a stooge of Fort Leavenworth? Believe me, I'm not. I really think that I have remained an anthropologist by being absolutely overawed by the variety of culture that I have seen and I had to I try to be at least a small part of it in order to interpret. Um, you know well, and certainly I work for the piggies, and I learned, I was told, never give me more than one page. I don't want your anthropological lecture. I just want one page. I had to learn what five years of field work meant to write one page. How are we going to confront Kim Jong-un if we don't know Korea? Is, with all due respect, is Mr. Rodman really a representative of many of us? You know, can't we do better than that? Uh, what are we going to do about Iran? There are two countries that are bent. Their, their existence depends on having a nuclear weapon. How are we going to deal with that without knowing something about the cultures of this? Who, who among American students today knows about North Korean churches.